Hello, this is episode 31 of This Week with David Rovix, making popular education popular again. It has certainly not been a slow week for news, as the pundits say. Military conflict between India and Pakistan, threats of war against Venezuela from both ruling parties in the U.S. as the empire slides ever faster towards open fascism. Trump met Kim in Hanoi while simultaneously making new threats at Iran and Cuba while his former lawyer testified in Congress. Scandal continues to embroil the governor of Virginia and other politicians there, one of whom says he's the victim of a right-wing witch hunt. Parts of California that were on fire last fall are now underwater. The Catholic Church is holding hearings on the sexual abuse of children and nuns by priests and bishops, a new proxy war threatens to break out in Mozambique, and Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel has just made an alliance with a party-slash-hate group called Jewish Power, made up of followers of the preacher of mass murder considered a terrorist even by the Israeli and U.S. governments of his day, Rabbi Meir Kahane. And now the Prime Minister is being charged with corruption by his own Attorney General. He says it's a left-wing witch hunt. I didn't even touch on most of the major international news stories of the week in that list, nor do I intend to. But occasionally surfacing in the headlines, in some places more than others, are a number of more or less national-scale scandals ostensibly involving anti-Semitism. Almost never surfacing in the headlines of the Western press, but covered constantly on some Arabic networks, is the fact that last Friday Israeli troops committed yet another massacre of unarmed civilians at the fence walling off the open-air toxic prison known as the Gaza Strip from its occupier, the country that controls and lays siege to all of its borders and prevents its access to the sea to the west or to the air above Israel. You in the West, hearing my voice, may be surprised to know that the IDF, has committed such a massacre every Friday since March of last year, leaving hundreds dead and thousands in wheelchairs for the rest of their lives. But this missive is only partially about that hidden piece of weekly news that after every Friday prayer's massacre most of us are unaware of. I say only partially because it's actually impossible to separate these massacres from the aforementioned anti-Semitism scandals, and that is by design, as I will explain. In the U.S., a congresswoman made a reference to U.S. foreign policy being influenced by one of the largest donors to U.S. congressional campaigns, AIPAC, the American-Israeli Political Action Committee. In England, the leader of the Labour Party and some of his associates are being smeared as anti-Semites because of a visit to a PLO cemetery during an official trip to Tunisia. And in France, the entire political class, along with the entire mainstream media, are frothing at the mouth over their efforts to paint the Gilets jaunes as anti-Semites. In Paris, a group of yellow vest protesters called a self-described Zionist philosopher a Zionist. The word Zionist was preceded by an expletive, so this is apparently now to be understood as that old corporate media trope known as veiled anti-Semitism which is usually a label for things they wish were anti-Semitic but aren't. This was clearly also the case with Jeremy Corbyn in England and Congresswoman Omar in the United States. Opposition to Israeli policies of weekly massacres, embargoes, bombings, indefinite detention of children, and wanton legalized bribery of American politicians is all construed somehow as anti-Semitism. How is it possible to conflate opposition to the theft of Palestinian land or the bribery of American politicians with hatred of Jews? Here are some bits of history and some word definitions necessary to understand the convoluted logic involved with these accusations, which are wrapped up with the discussion of what is and what isn't anti-Semitic speech and behavior. 1. For much of European history, as Jews were being kicked out of southern European countries, they were emigrating to eastern European countries, where in some cases the sophisticated new migrants became disproportionately wealthy and thus despised by much of the general population who lived in poverty. Therefore, ever since that time, any criticism of wealthy people, bribery, usury, lobbyists, capitalism, and especially banks are seen by some as anti-Semitic or at least veiled anti-Semitism. 2. Throughout its existence, leaders of the state of Israel have referred to Israel as the Jewish state, and AIPAC has referred to itself as the Jewish lobby. However, when non-Jews use terms like the Jewish lobby these days, this is often seen as some kind of anti-Semitic generalization. A generalization it is, and an incorrect one, but one that AIPAC and the Israeli government both encourage us to make as often as possible. 3. 
Although millions of Jews proudly refer to themselves as ardent Zionists and support Zionism, the successful movement to settle on and steal Palestinian land in order to form a state controlled explicitly by Jews now known as Israel, if a non-Jew calls someone a Zionist, whether there is an expletive preceding the term or not, this is now understood to be yet another form of veiled anti-Semitism. 4. The term Jew is not an insult, any more than the term Christian or Muslim is. About 20% of the population of the Jewish state is not Jewish, however, so when Palestinians are being attacked by Israeli soldiers, they don't say the Israelis are coming, because it's specifically Jewish Israeli soldiers coming to kill them. They don't say the soldiers are coming, because these are not just any soldiers, these are not Jordanian or Egyptian soldiers, they are Jewish Israeli soldiers. So they say the Jews are coming when the Jews are coming. This may be profoundly uncomfortable reality, but it's also a profoundly real one. For most people in most of the world, the whole discussion around Zionism and anti-Semitism is absurd. Anyone who knows anything about Israel outside of the capitalist West knows it's an apartheid state run by people called Jews, most people in the world have never met one, and that these people who run Israel regularly engage in building walls, demolishing homes, bulldozing olive groves, buying American fighter jets, and killing unarmed Palestinian children. If people know anything about Israel, that's what they know. None of this Zionist nonsense about flowers growing in deserts. The constant massacres, bombings, bulldozings, rampant torture of children, and other nasty habits of the self-proclaimed Jewish state give it a bit of a credibility issue among normal humans who aren't in the U.S. Congress or the British Parliament and aren't Germans drowning in guilt for the fact that their recent ancestors are largely responsible for Zionism becoming so popular among the Jewish diaspora in the first place with all the death and destruction it has wrought. Though in truth, even with the Nazi Holocaust to encourage Jews to flee Europe, which my extended family in Minsk unfortunately failed to do back then. Most Jews didn't want to go to Palestine, they wanted to go to the U.S. But because the great humanitarian Roosevelt administration didn't lift the quotas on Eastern European refugees until 1944, they had to go somewhere else if they could, or just die, as most of them did. But to the extent that the settler colonial Zionist movement did gain popularity among Jews and, with backing from the big, supposedly former colonial powers of the day, did successfully take over the neighborhood by force of arms, kick out the inhabitants, and never let them back in, it did so with support from all kinds of different varieties of Zionists. <clears throat> yes, there's not just one brand of Zionism, but to complicate matters, there are many. It has long been the case that the best friends of the state of Israel around the world have been other settler colonial states, Australia, South Africa, the U.S., so-called former colonial powers, Britain, France, Germany, and a selection of the most far-right torture states that happen to be in power in the world at any given time, currently including countries such as Hungary, Guatemala, and Brazil. However, there are other factors that cause the whole question of Zionism and anti-Semitism to get truly complicated. One is the fact that although there are among the ranks of those around the world who oppose Zionism lots of principled ecumenical enemies of oppression in all its forms, the ranks of anti-Zionists also include actual fascists who hate Jews for being Jews. The other, probably far more destructive factor in the whole equation, is the fact that among the ranks of those who support the Zionist project that is, the state of Israel and all the disenfranchisement and slaughter of Palestinians that necessarily goes along with maintaining power over an occupied people who don't want to be occupied and aren't dead yet, are people who otherwise appear to be progressive. Which then brings me to the title of this little rant. Who are these longtime Labor Party members attacking Corbyn as an anti-Semite on my Facebook page? Who are these otherwise sophisticated French philosophers who can't tell the difference between hatred of apartheid and hatred of all his fellow Jewish people? Who are these union and civil rights supporting Americans making oblique references to anti-Semitism on the left on the basis of a Muslim congresswoman's anti-lobbying tweet? First of all, they're real people. Yes, some of them are working for intelligence agencies who make those posts. This has been well documented, and in fact the Israeli government is proud of their propagandists on social media, as are lots of other government agencies globally. But there are real people, lots of them, who live with what to most of us seem like an impossible disconnect. In this case, we're talking about people who, for one reason or for many reasons, 
have developed a world view <clears throat> where for them it is consistent to go out on the streets to oppose the U.S. carpet bombing of Southeast Asia or even of Iraq. But when it comes to Israel, they support emergency military assistance when Israel runs out of bombs as it's destroying Gaza for the seventh time in the past decade. This is a reference to Bernie Sanders, among others. Unfortunately, with so many otherwise progressive supporters of Israeli apartheid, Zionism, among us, particularly in places like the U.S. and England, we end up in a situation where far too many people are intimidated by what is, admittedly, sometimes a complex and multifaceted debate. What's not complex, or shouldn't be, are the following points. 1. Only a minority of Jews identify with Israel or live in Israel, and Israel does not and never has represented the entire Jewish diaspora. 2. To use terms that people proudly identify with, such as Zionist, is not anti-Semitic, if we are describing a supporter of the State of Israel. 3. The United States government is run by the highest bidder. It is an auction, this is well known, and pointing this out is not anti-Semitic, any more than pointing out that the United States is in North America is anti-geographic. 4. Israel is an apartheid state that has been recognized as such by all rational visitors to the occupied territories, including me, South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu, all kinds of UN human rights commissioners, and other human rights groups, and a lot of other people. 5. The fact that Israel calls itself the Jewish state is run by Jews and has an almost entirely Jewish army that kills Palestinians every day will tend to cause some confusion in the world about what all this means. Some people will draw the erroneous conclusion that this self-proclaimed Jewish state represents all Jews, and that because an army of Jews kills unarmed Palestinians every day, that this Jewish army represents the Jewish diaspora. It doesn't. Just a lot of them. Like, for example, some of my Zionist relatives who no longer speak to me because they think I'm an anti-Semite. I was raised in part by a German Jew who was so traumatized by her childhood that she pretended to be an English Catholic for her entire adult life. She never mentioned Israel or even the fact that she was Jewish. She assimilated in a state of terror into her new home. Though in New York City she was literally surrounded by millions of Jews, she was still afraid to be Jewish. This degree of fear hopefully provides some idea of why the Jewish people are now so divided around the issue of Israeli apartheid. There are so many reactions to trauma, and there was probably no trauma suffered by humans in the known history of the planet as terrible as the Nazi Holocaust. There were many victims of this Holocaust, and Jews from across Europe were principal among them. People so deeply traumatized had three main reactions. One, Many, like my nanny, hid, assimilated, lived in fear, tried to be someone else. Untold millions of people in many different situations have done this in the history of humanity, including Sephardic Jews, many hundreds of years ago, from whom I'm also descended. This is where the term living in the closet came from. That's where they kept the menorahs. Two. Many embraced the idea that the horror of Nazism should never destroy any other society either. This is partially why the radical left in so many countries is so disproportionately full of Jews. 3. Many others embraced Zionism, <clears throat> which you can translate as the idea that never again means never again to us. Zionism was an escape further into sectarianism. Throughout Jewish history, as with the history of other historically marginalized groups, these various tendencies have been manifest. There were always different responses to anti-Semitism in Europe, and anti-Semitism was a major driving feature of European civilization for over a thousand years. Among Jews and non-Jews alike, there were those who could be successfully divided and conquered, and those who resisted this tendency. But naturally, grouping together and protecting others who you see as being part of your group is a sensible thing to do. And so, it's easy to see how Zionism could gain popularity in a year like 1940. Unfortunately, there is ultimately no safety or security on stolen land, surrounded by millions of resentful, impoverished, desperate refugees that you've created. 
Safety and security for Jews was really never the interest for the outside powers that have always been the benefactors Israel has depended on to make such a go of it up till now. For the great powers, it was always about having a European colonial outpost in a part of the world that Europeans have never been able to successfully colonize. But the progressive Zionists are able to repress all that awareness. It's hard to do that, so they're generally not much for rational conversation when it comes to the question of Israeli apartheid. Even calling apartheid apartheid upsets them. I think they're still calling it the only democracy in the Middle East, in fact, despite the fact that the millions of Palestinians living under Israeli military rule in the West Bank and Gaza are unable to vote in the Israeli elections that determine their fates. Unable to defend the indefensible, they attack. This is how you end up with supposed Labour Party progressives calling Jeremy Corbyn an anti-Semite. According to their narrative, those PLO people buried in that Tunisian cemetery are all terrorists. They killed innocent Israeli Olympic athletes, among others. And so for them, the entire bloody Israeli occupation, the theft of all those homes, the millions of refugees and squalid refugee camps, this is all just irrelevant to the point that terrorism, the killing of innocents, is wrong. So, if you lay a wreath in a cemetery where some of those who died in the course of this national liberation struggle are buried, you are then associated with the worst things any of them ever did, of course. So then if you lay a wreath at a cemetery with dead RAF pilots in it, does that mean you're endorsing the killing of each of the 50,000 civilians who were asphyxiated or crushed when the RAF bombed Dresden? If you lay a wreath on the graves of Israeli soldiers who died in their war of independence, are you endorsing the permanent expulsion of 700,000 Palestinians from their homes by Jewish terrorists who induced fear through massacres and the threats of massacres? Few people would say so. But in the convoluted logic of the progressive Zionists, it can be nothing but anti-Semitic to acknowledge the suffering of the Palestinian nation by laying a wreath in a cemetery, or to express anger at a famous self-proclaimed Zionist philosopher for being a Zionist at a time in history when the army of Zionism, the Israeli army, has today just committed another massacre. Or to point out that the American-Israeli Political Action Committee has undue influence on U.S. politicians. It most certainly, verifiably does. Because it's all about the Benjamins, like Omar and Puff Daddy said. I met someone the other week who just gave a speech about the lessons history can teach. He talked about the colonies with a furrowed brow, how they tortured the rebels of Mau Mau. But when the subject turned to children in indefinite detention, this was something I was evidently not supposed to mention. He began to shout as if he thought I might be deaf. The most moral army in the world is the IDF. I met someone else who had a lot to say about how the U.S. government had treated the Diné and other native peoples forced to live on reservations. What an awful way to treat those nations. But when the conversation drifted to the Middle East, the guy became so angry, to say the least. When I mentioned Arabs, he began to yell, all those terrorists can go to hell. There are many contradictions you may find. It's a complex world with all kinds of strange people. But at the top of my list is the progressive Zionist. Once I did a concert tour of the Holy Land. I was on my seventh encore by popular demand. I sang of civil rights. They just wanted more songs about the horrors of the Vietnam War. They were right there with me till I mentioned Palestine. Up until that point, things were fine. When the song was over, the room with silence filled till someone shouted, those savages should be killed. There are many contradictions you may find. It's a complex world with all kinds of strange people. But at the top of my list 
is the progressive Zionist. Now, when this song is over, I can guarantee I'll be called an anti-Semite most passionately. That and other insults will be flung in my direction. I'll be blamed if Trump wins the next election. But I got on the blacklist long ago, you see. You won't hear me on NPR or BBC. Call me what you will. I don't care a bit. I'll just tell it like it is. Till the day I quit. There are many contradictions you may find. It's a complex world with all kinds of strange people. But at the top of my list is the progressive Zionist. This has been episode 31 of This Week with David Rovix. You can find a written version of each episode in blog form at davidrovix.com slash thisweek, as well as on Blogger, Tumblr, Reddit, and Medium. At davidrovix.com slash this week, you can also stream or download the podcast, get the RSS feed of both the podcast and the blog, and find out how to support these efforts, which are all crowdfunded. You can also listen to the podcast via the free David Rovix mobile app, or you can search for This Week with David Rovix on any of the usual podcasting platforms, now including Stitcher, as well as Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, and iTunes. The podcast is also available for radio broadcasters to use each week via the Pacifica audio port. The song Progressive Zionist is one I just finished recently, inspired to do so by the accusations being leveled against Corbyn, the Gilets Jaunes, and Congresswoman Omar. Okay, signing off for now. Hope to see you here next week.